I guess this is a one-man show. They, uh, they set it up when I was uh, agreeing to come. We were talking about panels that could, they could want, we would do. And they said, okay, Dave, we want one panel, which is just meet David Gator. And I'm like, okay, what am I going to talk about? We could talk about yourself. I think I am authority on that subject. Sure, I could do that. <laughs> so yeah, this is neat. Great con, isn't it? Like, how you guys been doing? Yeah? It's interesting, because uh, I guess I, I'm used to going to some of the, the really big cons where just a sea of people, right? And this one's a little bit more intimate. You can run into people in the hall and just chat. Uh, I, know, I know a few of your faces uh, I saw at the, the mixer on, uh, on the Thursday, which is great. Uh, so, okay, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about myself, and uh, afterwards I, I'll gladly open it up to, to questions. Just a uh, warning in advance. I can only answer questions about Dragon Age Inquisition that have already been announced. I am perfectly happy to go into detail on those things, but I, I can't answer new things like, is very romanceable? <laughs> <laughs> I know you're all curious. Um, so, a little bit about myself. I think the, the most common question I get asked is how did you get into the industry? And I, I, I always find that question interesting uh, and a little bit amusing just because the, the question is often asked uh, by people who are hoping to use my story as uh, possibly helping them get into the industry. And my answer is always, my story will never help you get into the industry. I don't know if you've heard it. I've told it a few times, but it's a good story. Why not? Uh, so I was uh, 27 at the time. That was back in 1999, if you want to do the math, that's okay. <laughs> um, and I already had a career. I was uh, working in the hotel industry. I was a general manager for uh, uh, a travel lodge hotel. And uh, it was fine. I, I, I was actually, <laughs> if, you, if you watch me on the forums, you would never guess that I, that I used to be really good at handling customers. <laughs> um, but uh, I had a career, and uh, Bioware was in Edmonton, and I knew nothing about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, the idea that uh, uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada could be a place where video games were made was pretty foreign. Baldur's Gate 1 had already come out, and I had heard of it, but not played it, and I, had no, I would not have put the two together. I had a friend uh, whose name was Calvin. He was an artist who worked at Bioware, and I knew he did something video game related, but I never really asked, and I thought, well, if, it's, if he works in Edmonton on something video game related, it has to be pretty rinky-dinky. <laughs> uh, but they had uh, done Baldur's Gate 1, and they were, they were starting work on Baldur's Gate 2, and they were planning on making that game a lot bigger, and so they wanted uh, some, s some more writers, uh, and they asked everybody who worked there at the time, said, if you know anybody who has some writing talent, has maybe written something game-related, uh, let us know. And uh, my friend Calvin was in a LARP that I was running, in a live-action role-playing <laughs> game that I had made custom rules for. So I had written a rule book for it. And so he gave James Olin, who was the, who was the lead designer in Baldur's Gate 2, um, my rule book without even telling me. So I get this phone call uh, at the hotel from BioWare, which sounded like a, you know, some kind of medical <laughs> company, uh, asking me to come in for an interview. And I thought, oh, that's weird. Okay, I'll go in. And back then, uh, BioWare had, this, had the offices on uh, White Avenue. It's sort of the, the, the party strip uh, in, in Edmonton, which is, it's Edmonton, so it's not much of a party strip. But... <laughs> Uh, but the office is there, you walk in, and it was like Nightmare on Elm Street. Like there were the ducks that were visible and things hanging down, and you were just certain that Freddy Krueger was going to come around the corner any moment. And I thought, wow, this place is going to fold any second. <laughs> and, but I went in and, and uh, talked with James. He asked me to bring some writing that I'd done, so I brought some short stories that I'd written. And, but we chatted, and I mean, I grew up uh, playing uh, dr um, Dungeons and Dragons. So I was very familiar with that. Although I'd left D&D long ago behind and moved on to more advanced tabletop games, I guess. I was like, D&D, play Shadowrun. <laughs> 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 
But I, I knew all about D&D, &D and I thought it was very interesting. And we chatted for a while. I met with uh, uh, Ray Muzika and, and Greg Zeshek, and, and they were cool. And uh, uh, eventually, they, they, they offered me a, a job. And it was about half the pay I was making at the hotel. And you know, looking around the place, it's like, well, so I could take this job at half the pay and probably be jobless inside of six months, right? So I turned them down. Went, that was on a Friday. I went into my hotel on the Monday, and my, um, my regional manager from Mississauga, which is in Ontario, it's way out east, he was, he was there in my office um, unannounced, which was unprecedented. And uh, to tell me that the hotel management company for whom I worked had been bought out by a larger management company, and of course, since it's a, it's a management company, they all have, they have their own general managers, which meant <clears throat> they were laying off all the GMs for the, the current management company. So I got walked out of uh, the, the, the hotel with my box of stuff in my hands, thinking, oh, maybe I will give that job a try. <laughs> Um, so I called James and I said, hey, is that job offer still open? He's like, yeah, that'd be awesome. So I started on, on uh, uh, Baldur's Gate 2. They, they called me the machine uh, because I, I wrote really quickly. Um, Baldur's Gate 2 had 1.2 million words of dialogue. Uh, I can say <clears throat> without too much exaggeration that I probably am responsible for about half of that myself. Uh, just because I, th I think uh, some of the writers who had come in off of Baldur's Gate 1 were pretty tired. Uh, they maybe a little bit burned out, and I came in, and then it's, it, it was very neat the, the way the setup was. I think my first, very first writing assignment was to write the Copper Coronet. Remember the tavern where you, where you met like Anamin and, and, and uh, various characters in the, in the middle of Athcatla? And they said, well, just give that a try and, and see how you work out. And I jumped in on it, and I was writing like the bartender and Anamin's opening dialogue and stuff. I'm gonna kill you, man. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, and I and I jumped in on that, and I wrote it, and, and then uh, a couple days later, I went to James, and I said, "Okay, I'm done." And he's like, "You're done." So that that's how I became the machine, because they just kept giving me assignments, and I just kept working. I was I was 27. It was it was my 20s. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> I had boundless energy. I swear to God. So yeah, that, that was uh, how I started, and I was just a writer uh, for a while. Um, I guess the stuff that I don't normally talk about is, is a bit of the more personal issues. Um, for instance, I mean, uh, I was out to my family and my friends, but when I started at BioWare, I was not out at work. Uh, and the reason for that, I guess, is that, I mean, I was a little bit older than everybody. I was older than James, my boss. Uh, Luke Christensen, who was a writer I worked with, was my age, but everybody else was quite a bit younger, early 20s, you know, just out of college, and there was a little bit of a, of a frat house atmosphere, and it just, it just seemed like, mm, I don't know if I want to uh, expose myself to the possibility that, that, you know, young guys out of college, you know, dude bros might give me a hard time, so I just didn't talk about it. I didn't really think that that was an environment that uh, I needed to talk about it, and so it just, just never came up. And I felt bad, in a way, and I've, I've spoken about this elsewhere, that, that later on, I know, um, oh, it must have been nine, ten years ago now, maybe more. Um, seven or eight years ago, Canada passed uh, gay marriage nationwide. And it's funny, because you know Canadians will see you guys wrangle with it down here, and it's, it's a little bit bewildering just because it's such a done issue up there. It's just like nobody even bats an eye at it, about it anymore. But we didn't have it back when I first started with Bioware, and there came a point where the first Canadian province to pass gay marriage was Ontario, which is where Toronto is, out east. And um, I remember when that happened, because uh, a, one of the programmers who was gay, and I had no idea, uh, sent an email around saying hey, him and his boyfriend were going to Toronto and they were going to get married. And they, the responses from everyone at Bioware were basically, woo, that's awesome, congratulations, from everyone. And I, I remember being a little bit humbled. You know, I just, uh, all that time I'd spent underestimating the people that I, with whom I'd worked, thinking that uh, because they were young and male, that they wouldn't accept me. It wasn't true. 
And so I told them, you know, I just started, just, just started talking about it, about my personal life, which I'd never really, uh, uh, I'd never lied about, but just never really discussed. And I would mention it off and on. And no, <laughs> nobody batted an eye about it. And I thought, wow, that's, that's, uh, that was an incredible waste of time to worrying about it. But you know, I think too, uh, times have changed. Uh, when I think about when I started in the industry, um, it, was, it was really different. And I, I think too, I, I, and I spoke about this in the, in the keynote, um, I'm not uh, the, the, the first uh, same-sex romances that we did were in Jade Empire. It's not a team on which I worked. And uh, I was not involved in that process. I mean, the people on that team knew that they were gay people that worked. They knew I was gay. They, they knew that the, the program I mentioned was gay. We're not the only ones. So, I mean, there was, a, there was an awareness, I guess, but we were not part of the, with the, 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 the process that led to that. I, I think it just, uh, at some point, when, the, when the, the Jade Empire team was talking about romances, they brought up, well, why don't we open up Sky, and I think it was um, Silk Fox, to both, both sexes, and the response was being like, yeah, why not? And uh, I heard about it, I, uh, the, they sent out the email that this is something that they were doing, and they kind of expected there might be a bit of a, a repercussion to it uh, publicly, but that they were gonna go ahead and do it and damn the consequences. And I remember being shocked. And I, I, I think if there is something to be said about why Gamer X is important and why inclusivity is important is, because even as a gay man, I thought my viewpoint had no place in games. I thought, without even questioning it, that I would spend my career writing other people's fantasies and never my own. And that didn't really make me sad even. It just, what else would you do? Why, why, why would anybody put a, put a gay perspective into a game? And the fact that I thought that, 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 that's part of what inclusivity means. To, I mean, it, it's not that I felt bad about it, but why didn't I think that my viewpoint mattered? Why didn't I think that there were other people who, for whom that, that viewpoint would be appreciated? I think that says something, that, that, that it took uh, a bunch of straight white guys to put it in Jade Empire to sort of open my eyes and think, wow, well, yeah, maybe this is something that can be done. I remember I, I um, uh, Dragon Age Origins, when I got uh, uh, handed lead writership for, for that game. And James said, uh, you know, when we do the romances, you know, feel free to, to do what Jade Empire did and, and include that. And I was like, yeah, I'm way ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember I was working on Zevran and, and uh, um, I think initially I was thinking, uh, I was trying to think gay romance, because I remember I'd been reading about how the CIA had um, gone other way to recruit assassins who were gay because they tended to have less uh, family connections. You know, they, they, they could be more loners and, and that was the thing. I'm sure that was like the 50s or 60s, but I remember thinking that would be neat if that was, uh, you know, for an assassin like a crow if that was also an aspect. And it's, it's funny, because it's like, uh, I never you know, thought bisexual uh, Zevran was a, was a way to sort of uh, put that in and still get sort of uh, the most use out of the content. So even back then, we, we, we were still not considering like, that having a gay character uh, could be a thing, that, that, that uh, we could have exclusive content. But even then, uh, that, that was still, that was great, that, that, that I could uh, try something like that. And, uh, that everyone else would um, would jump on board. I think it's it's uh, some of the talk that uh, that happens uh, here, and, and there's this idea that that you know um, gay content, LGBT inclusiveness is only going to happen. It's only going to happen if uh, gay developers push the envelope. And well, that's that's not completely untrue. I mean, gay developers have their part to play. Uh, in my experience, the the jumps have been done not through gay developers at all. Uh, I know uh, Mass Effect 3 had uh, our first, uh, well, I mean, other than Juhani. Juhani was an interesting case, simply because uh, when that came up, 
Uh, she was kind of hidden. I don't know if you guys played the game. She never says, I love you. She never says uh, uh, straight out that she's a lesbian or, or that it, it's almost like a, it was a quasi-romance. It was sort of our, our first uh, foray into the idea of it, but Mass Effect 3 had our first uh, uh, gay romances with uh, Cortez and Trainer. You got any of you played Mass Effect 3? And there as well, the reason those romances happened was due to some great uh, straight allies at BioWare who, who said, we'd like to do this. So the, the, way, the way that content gets into the game is not through consensus. It's not through really through pressure from the outside. It, re it requires, at its initial point, someone on the team who says, I would like to do this content. And generally, once there is somebody who wants to do it, it's a matter of getting people to sort of, okay, they'll let you do it, but there has to be somebody who's interested in doing it to begin with. And the people who were interested in doing that were straight people. Uh, Patrick Weeks, uh, Karen Weeks, who are both here today. Are you guys in the back? Hello. <laughs> uh, I don't want to forget Dusty Everman as well. Yeah, they, they, these are people who, who wanted to include this content and fought for it and, and got it into the game. And it's interesting because, I mean, uh, there's always a bit of a reaction to it. Uh, uh, both, there's the negative reaction, but there's also this sort of intense scrutiny, you know? You know what I'm talking about from the media, uh, sort of... Uh, um, the, the tension, I mean, I had that recently when, uh, when Dorian in uh, Dragon Age Inquisition got announced as a gay character. And it announced, I say announced, I can use air quotes around that because it was an interview where I was talking about Dorian and there was one question where it's like, well, what's different about Dorian than any character you've written before? I'm like, well, he's gay. Well, I said fully gay, but he's gay. Uh, and, and that's different from any of the other characters I've written. Full stop. Not an announcement. It's not like we put out a press release. By the way, Dorian is gay. You can all thank us later. We'll leave the building. <laughs> but that is how a lot of people viewed it because the, the media kind of picked up on it. They, re they reported, DeBioware announces gay character. Well, we, okay, we, we did an interview where we mentioned he was gay. And then, of course, uh, a lot of people who only, apparently only read headlines said, why do you announce, have to announce that? Were you looking for points? We were looking for awards, and I'm like, well, there are worse things to do than getting points and, and, and thanks for including you know, gay content. That's not, that's not what we did, but, you know, and I, and I think, um, uh, so it's weird that, there's, that there, there, there's that kind of scrutiny, not just from the trolls, there's scrutiny from the media, scrutiny from you know, activists. Uh, and it'll be nice when we get to the point where that kind of scrutiny isn't necessary anymore. It'd be nice if I could, if I could write a gay character and that, in, that inclusivity is A, just expected. Like, why wouldn't you do that? Not what, that's the thing is like a lot of the, the commentary is, well, how do you justify including this content? And my response is always, why does that content require justification? Are we not past that point yet? No, apparently we're not. But I think the, that if once we get over this hump of, of intense scrutiny and it becomes old news, well, Bioware announces gay character and the, the reaction I would hope at some point would be, yeah. How many people in Bioware hate? Yes, true. Um, so once we're past that, that hump of, of, of scrutiny, maybe, maybe uh, it'll make it easier for us as well as for other developers to, that, that, that they can do that. And I think you can see some of that. I mean, I, was, I think in the keynote I mentioned as well, Last of Us, which I remember when I was playing, I, was, I remember getting to Bill, and I was like, wait, 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 wait. Did that just happen? That's awesome. And it's, it, it's, it's, what was especially great about it was that it wasn't the point of his character. I mean, not that you could ignore it. I mean, and it was definitely there. You could sort of go, la, 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 Liberace wasn't gay either. If he really wanted to. <laughs> but uh, it made, it added a dimension to his character which was so different because it could have, it would have been, think about it, 
it would have been so easy to do Bill as a very generic, run-of-the-mill kind of character. But think about the, the elements that there's just him being gay added to, the, say, the relationship between him and his, and his partner who died when he talks about him. If that was just a partner that was just this guy that, that he hated and, and had a falling out with, fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not like, like him being gay was necessary for him to be more interesting. But think about the, 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 the nuances that added to his portrayal and the stops that makes you think about the things that weren't said by the narrative. You know, like suddenly the picture of how that falling out between him and his partner happened is so different in your head. And it was great, sort of the, the, the point at which the, the, the first assumption you make about Bill, and then you get to the point where, oh, oh, and so, suddenly the narrative is, is completely different. I, I just thought it was great. And there are things that, that uh, Bioware can learn from that and other developers can learn from that. I, and I, and I, I will not say that our, our portrayal of, of uh, uh, LGBT characters is perfect. We, 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 we are trying. Uh, and I think... Uh, we, we, we're, we're doing some great things, and, but we will keep working on them. Uh, I say personally, uh, it is something that, that comes up when we're working. It, if I speak for who, who, what I do, uh, I think there's sometimes a misapprehension over what a, a writers do for a video game company or what a lead writer does. And I think a lot of people um, mentally, they may draw a comparison more towards uh, perhaps a maybe a screenwriter. Like that we, we go away and we write the game and then we deliver it to the rest of the team saying, here's your story, go to. You know, and that's, that's so not how it works. It is a, it is a collaborative process. If, if, I, if when we start, I have people above me like Mike Laidlaw, he's the lead designer. I have Mark Dyer, who's the project director. And there are people above them who, who want to, to look at the bigger picture and, I, the team, the writing team will say, come to them and we'll get some, some direction first. Like, well, uh, uh, we'd like to have this kind of conflict and, and maybe try the, these sorts of elements. Could you include those in the story? And we'll go, okay, good. We'll go away. We'll come up with like a very, very brief, like a, almost like a paragraph, a, a blurb, a pitch. And then we'll come back to the, 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 the powers that be and we'll say, all right, we'll do the pitch and we'll say, this is what we're thinking. And they'll say, eh, no. That is generally how it happens, because the first, the first pitch is never the one. And it will go back and forth a few times, and once we get closer, they'll say, ah, we like that, and we like that, uh, but we don't like that you did this. And, and, and sometimes the, the feedback is, is terribly nonspecific. It just, they say, well, we don't like it. Well, what don't you like about it? <laughs> That's not helpful, Mr. Laidlaw. But eventually we'll get to a consensus and then that, it's like, okay, we're good, we're good. Boom, and I'll go to my writing team and I'll start, I just start chopping up the story and saying, you get this part, you get this part, you get this part. But even then, writers like, like Patrick don't get to go off and, and make what they're doing and come back later and say, I'm done! And I look at it and say, oh God, and now there's nothing, in, no. There's a process by which they, they do the same thing. They, they write a, well, this is what I'd like to do and pitch it to me and I go, Because, you know, Mike can't be the only one with that power. <laughs> but I mean, uh, uh, so he's, he, Patrick will pitch his character to me or his plot to me. We'll talk about it. We'll, we'll work something out that is like, okay, let's try this. And then we will take his character or his plot, if, it, if it's big enough. Like the small ones, uh, the powers that be maybe don't care about it so much. But if it's like a major character, like a follower or one of the, the critical path plots, well, we will then together bring that to the powers that be. And if you get, if you get the impression, there's a lot of meetings that go on. <laughs> Our meeting rooms are worked over time. And we'll, we'll pitch it to, to the powers that be and say, this is what, what Patrick and I are thinking about this plot or this character. And we'll get the same thing, which is like, well, we like that, we don't like that. And, and that is an ongoing process. And it's not just between Patrick and I. And, and the powers that be. Say for a, a, a character that Patrick had wrote, like say Cole or Iron Bull in Inquisition, there'd be me working with Patrick to try to work out the story. Patrick sitting down with the, the concept artists and working out, well, is there, how, how is this character going to look? How is how they look going to help tell their story? Is there anything that the artists would, like something that they'd like to do, which maybe Patrick hasn't considered? 
Because they were like, well, you know, they were like, I'd really like to have a character with one hand. Okay, weird, cool. <laughs> we could do that. You know, but that, that's a thing. I mean, I, I, that's a really simplistic example. But it's like, let's say, there's a level designer who wants to try out a, a kind of power that they want to give to a follower, that, that you know, they can summon uh, demons. Okay, that in Dragon Age, that requires a very specific character. But I mean, it, we, we, that's not something that we can say, just add afterwards, you know? Oh, we have Wynn. Can we give her the demon summoning power? No. <laughs> so we'd, we'd really would have to, more at the concept stage, start taking into consideration what, what kind of character Wynn is going to be. And if we're gonna make her summon demons, maybe kindly grandmotherly ladies, not what we're going for. <laughs> Although that would be kind of badass, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a grandma and I'm gonna fuck you up. <laughs> <laughs> that would have made that, 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 the circle tower beginning a lot, like, a lot different. <laughs> she's got all the kids down there, she's like, get away from those children. <laughs> Jesus. Morgan's like, I like her better this way. <laughs> so that's, that's the, the process of the, my position as lead writer is, is like half coordination. I have my writers like, like Patrick, uh, Mary Kirby, Cheryl Chi, Luke Christensen. These are people that have been with, with uh, the Dragon Age series since the beginning. Uh, in Inquisition, we've got Sylvia Fekatakuti. We've got uh, Brienne O'Grady Batier. Did I get that right? Yeah. Thumbs up, I did. Uh, uh, did I forget anybody? No, I don't think I did. All right, anyway, uh, that, that, that's my writing team. That's a lot of writers to kind of manage. It's more me. Uh, trying to help them uh, figure out what they're going to work on, helping, helping connect them to the powers that be, getting approval, uh, me reviewing their stuff, and trying to keep us all on the same page. Because it has to, it, at the end of the day, it has to sound like it was kind of sort of written by the same person. I mean, I, I'm sure if any of you have played Dragon Age games extensively, I'm sure over time you could probably pick out, say, the characters that I wrote. You know what I mean? That, that, that every writer has their sort of ticks that they do. Luke will write in circles. You're like, oh God, where is this conversation going, Luke? He's like, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. And, All right, Luke, you've been here long enough. I guess you get the pass. <laughs> um, but overall, the tone has to be consistent. And the writers will spend a lot of time talking about, well, what, it, what are the themes we're trying to, t we're trying to get across here? Um, Dragon Age 2 is a very specific example. One of the major overarching themes was the, the issue of personal freedom versus the security of society. That's the sort of the mages and Templars argument. And I thought that was, that was timely and we thought that was a, a good issue to explore. It's not gonna come up in every conversation and in every plot, but we, by the end of the game, we want to have said something. And I, I think that uh, the mistake that often gets made about game, game stories in general is that they have to be escapist fluff. I mean, they can be escapist fluff, but they don't only have to be escapist fluff. Escapism is great. You could have, but you could have escapism and at the same time say something that's significant. And it, when you say something significant, it doesn't necessarily have to hit someone over the head. That's the problem I always have with the narrative that starts when, whenever something like this character is gay starts, is that, the, the, that there's this right away, this assumption on some parts that by virtue of making that character gay, that, that doing that had to be so deliberate that there couldn't be anything else about that character that's worthwhile speaking of. That was the only reason for Dorian's existence, for instance. And it's like, well, Dorian being gay was, was important to me as a writer. And I think that uh, part of uh, having characters with specific sexualities, which we, we hadn't done, say, in, in uh, the previous games, um, allowed us to tell different kinds of stories. So it's not like we want to make their sexuality irrelevant to their character. But in not making it irrelevant, does, that doesn't automatically make it, make it the dominating point of, of their existence. It's not true for any of us in this room, is it? I mean, uh, uh, my being gay, uh, I was out at work and I never really talked about it publicly for a long time. And that was mostly because I didn't want to get into a situation with fans when we were talking about game content or romances, with which I get into discussions a lot online. I did, for a long time, I just didn't want to get into the situation where 
Uh, somebody's saying, well, yeah, you think that, but that's because you're the gay guy. And it was, it was actually kind of tough for a while because there were, it, it didn't come up very often, but every now and again, there, will, there would be that online discussion where it's like, you know, I've reached this point in this conversation where suddenly my being gay is no longer irrelevant to the narrative. And yet, um, I wasn't sure how to discuss that publicly, just because it's like, well, I didn't want to say I use that point in that in say this argument or this discussion. I didn't want to be that that for be the point of entry where I say, well, by the way, keep in mind that you are talking to a gay man. So be careful about how <laughs> how are you you're painting my participation in, in this this uh, in this particular issue. And then eventually, I would, I would just reach the point where it's like, you know what, I, I'm, I'm 42. See, I did the math for you. <laughs> 42, and I don't even care anymore. Uh, and, then, and again, I think it, we reached a point where uh, it's enough of an issue in the industry where saying that was important, even though I, I don't think I, I, I'd particularly hidden it, but I think it was important to state out writing and get that out there. And, if the, and then I finally decided that if there were people who were gonna say, well, you're shoving the gay agenda down our throats. It's always down their throats, incidentally. <laughs> uh, that if they wanted to do that, you know, good on you. Because I mean, I, I, I know that Bioware uh, does not include gay content solely because I'm there. It's not like, you know, the, the writers or artists or whatever will be having a meeting where they're discussing about a character and I will come up over the fence. <laughs> <laughs> they have a shiver go through the groups like, shit, guess we better do something gay. <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. I, I'm confident that, that I, you know, I know that that's, that's not uh, uh, how that content got included. I know that there are layers of management above me, going all the way up to EA, of people that not only are okay with LGBT content going into our games, but actively want to see it happen. You know, that we, we include something and, and I get into an argument that I, I don't feel great about online. I mean, it happens. But I'll get into an argument with, a, say, a troll or something, and I don't always handle it as well as that, that Bastal guy, the, the straight white gamer. Sometimes I'm eloquent, sometimes I'm less eloquent. But I'll feel kind of bad about that and think, oh, and, and I'll have, but I'll have like, you know, Aaron, our, 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 our GM, the guy with the feels, uh, and he will come by my office and say, Dave, I just want, want to tell you that I want you to know that I support you and I thought that was awesome. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. That it's not just, you know, my, the lead designer on our project, that it's the GM of the Edmonton studio, that it's, it's the head of the games label at EA, that these are people that, that you know, you could, you could go, uh, kind of kind of cold and merciless and say, well, they just want gay people's money. Yes. <laughs> yes, they do. And isn't it nice, as speaking as somebody, a gay person who plays games, to have companies look at you and go, hmm. <laughs> well, I think it's kind of nice. Uh, anyway, so the, the fact that that there are these people in the company that actively want to see that happen. It makes for a great environment. I'm sure not, not all developers have that situation. Uh, there, there are all kinds of people in the world and, all, and it really, like I said elsewhere, it would only take one in that chain. One person, lead designer, head of the studio, head of the project, uh, some, somebody in, in, in the EA management level, one person in that chain to say, oh, I don't think we're ready for this. And it would just stop. And I'm sure that's what happens most of the time. And, and, and what it needs to be in order for that to change is for, for there to be an acknowledgement. I think it's not even that, that putting LGBT content in the games uh, is beneficial necessarily, that it necessarily will lead to more money, although they're always good with that. You know, more money, awesome. I think they're, they're, that they're waiting in many, many cases for some proof that that kind of uh, content inclusion is not actively harmful. You know what I mean? The idea that, well, because a lot of it is just, is just uh, um, uh, anecdotal evidence. 
we have the anecdotal evidence of there being a bunch of trolls who are loud and who yell and, and who are, who are uh, very vitriolic. Does, do those guys shouting and going around to every farm, is that bad press for us? Does that actively detract from our sales? Or do the majority of straight people not give a shit about what these guys have to say and can see for, for what it is? You'd like to think that, that that's true, but you don't really know, right? And I think once we get to the point where it's like, ah, you know, they're the, once there are more games out there that have that content and it just, it's fine, it, the sales, you can't say point to this one and say, well, the games without LGBT content sold way more and the ones that, the with are all limited sales. Once reached the point where that's true, companies in general will probably go, eh, okay, not an issue anymore. And I think that would be nice. Um, I think uh, this would be a good point to open it up to some questions, if you have them. Uh, do, do we have a microphone, or should I just point? It's a small room, I guess. <laughs> How about you, you first, sir? Yeah. Um, hmm. Oh, that's a, that's a tough question just because we don't have, it's not like we have a gay lobby within Bioware. <laughs> but no, it's, it's a good point because it would, be, it would be completely false to say that everybody within the LGBT community gets along nicely and has exactly the same viewpoint. <laughs> no, not true. I mean, uh, a lot, think about uh, when, when the, the, the discussion of gay stereotypes comes up. Uh, even within the gay community, there is no agreement on what constitutes a negative stereotype versus a positive stereotype. I myself am often uncomfortable when that conversation reaches a point where it's like, well, in order for it to not be a negative stereotype, we must present a gay character as straight acting. That they must be masculine and, and uh, 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 muscled or, 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 you know, uh, athletic and male or whatever, and it's like, well, but not every gay man is like that. Are we implying that the, the effeminate gay man is, is not acceptable for public consumption? I think a lot of it has to do with the context. What are you trying to do with that stereotype? Do you have, do you have a breadth in your portrayal? Because like, so not every character is going to have the ability to have depth. Some characters are going to be on, on screen for three seconds. But if you, among your three second characters, are they all stereotypes? So I think that that's... When we have discussions, it's like, yes, uh, not, not every gay person in Bioware, not every gay person in, in the... So like, so like I would expect that because I am, am a, a gay writer working on this game, that every gay fan should agree that what I'm doing is the, is the perfect portrayal or that there's nothing, no other different voices that can be done. Like, I mean, even, even from uh, speaking from the perspective of a, of a gay character specifically, I only have my personal experience to draw from. That's not entirely limiting because one is not needed. You don't need to write characters that only draw from your personal perspective. I mean, I, I've written lots of straight romances as well. So, uh, uh, but I mean, uh, I think the thing I like is that it, as long as there is respectful communication uh, with the gay community, if they say, "Well, what about gay characters like this?" Could you, you know? And it's it's worthy. It's worthy of thought to not say that there's only one way to have a gay character, and that is the David Gator way. It's not, it's not true. I mean, yeah, so yeah, I think there, had, there has been a little bit of discussion. We have a discussion among the writers. I mean, uh, just because the rest of my writers are not, are not gay doesn't mean that they don't have opinions. They have lots of opinions. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes, you know, they will correct me. They'll say, well, you know, Dave, you don't know you're gay. <laughs> but when you, you did this thing with this character, did, don't you think you, maybe you, you were kind of saying this? I'm like, oh, shit, you're right. It still happens, so it's, there's, there's no foolproof way. Another question? Uh, I think, yes, oddly, uh, it is very easy to fall into the trap, and it doesn't only apply to sexuality, to fall into the trap of the default. Because, you know, you, you want to, 
you don't want to make everything the exception. And if you make everything the exception, you run into this sort of this, this notion that, that the things that are supposed to be common are not actually common because the player never sees them. That, that's fair. But you also run into the, the, the trap of, of, even as a writer, we'll write characters. I'll just do it for, for, for example. Uh, we were well into uh, making Inquisition where our VO department came back to us and said, uh, you guys, you, I'm looking at the, the casting list and you have so many male characters versus female characters. And, and Caroline Livingston, who's our, who's our, uh, our VO director, said, I, I'd like to, to have more female characters. Can you take a look? And it was easy. Like, we just went through. It's like, oh, you know what the problem is? We had a, a lot of soldiers and Templars and stuff like that. And I think everybody who was doing their plots was making the majority of them male just because that was their plot. And, but it's when you accounted for the numbers overall, it's like, wow, OK, you know what? That is, Caroline, that is an excellent point we went through and, and just like, and you just have to stop and, and ask yourself a question at some point. So we matter if more of these characters are female? The answer 90% of the time is like, no, no. So we like, you just added them. And not that we wanted to suddenly, you know, you meet a group of Templars and it's like, female force. <laughs> it's like, this group of Templars is suspiciously female. <laughs> but, but is there any wrong, anything wrong with having, you know, like, in this group of Templars, there's like a couple of them that are female. There's a couple of them that are POCs. Eh, you know, and, and I think that adds to the, visi the visibility and just sort of like the, it doesn't have to be a big thing. Uh, it's, it's not that difficult. I think if there's anything that developers do is they lack that point in development where that question gets asked because they generally just don't think of it. You know, especially the POC question. Uh, the, the, uh, all except for one of my writers were all white. And so it's very easy just to, to that, that's the default that, that you sit in because you, when you think of characters and, it, and it's hard. Sometimes you, you, it, it requires deliberate effort. I know when I write my documentation, I will generally use she as a pronoun. Not because, for, the, for just if I'm speaking of the player, for instance. Not because I necessarily want to write uh, from the viewpoint that the player is female, but because I want to remind myself when I'm reading not to fall into the trap of always thinking of the player as male. Because the, 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 the real trap of the default is even when it's a very specific perspective, because at the default, people tend to treat it as neutral. You know what I mean? That, that, that because if we say he, that's as good as a neutral pronoun. And that's, that's, that's not good. It's not a good default to have. So you wanna, you wanna play games with yourself to sort of keep that in mind. And I mean, it helps, it helps if you have a team that like, we're pretty good at, at, uh, at doing reviews and going around and, and, and so those questions will come up. And thankfully, I have a, the writing team is, is such that uh, I have a lot of different viewpoints on the team so that ideally, uh, you know, having those viewpoints on the team means that, that some, at some point, someone will bring it up and, and, and sort of get us over the hurdle of, of the, the assumptions that we, we sometimes, and, and even with the, the viewpoints, that doesn't always happen. We would, things, will, things will get through and nobody thinks, thinks twice about it and then it goes public and someone will say, ah, oh, you did this thing, that's really shitty. Oh, yeah. T guys, <laughs> you were all there with me. They're like, yeah, yeah, well, you know, that, that it happens. What, yeah, yeah, <laughs> crazy. Uh, hi. Uh, I have a question about the representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did anybody hear that question? Uh, about tr uh, transgender representation and why in the comics I chose to have May revealed as, as transgender as topless. Uh, that was a specific decision. I know that uh, uh, one of the origins of May, uh, there was a comment that came after uh, DA2. Somebody came in our forums and said, look, you guys, uh, I think it's really shitty that you include transgender characters who are specifically prostitutes and uh, only, uh, well, generally used as, as, uh, as comedy. And it's like, you know what, that's a, an excellent point. I mean, uh, that person on the forums got piled on, people like, trying running to our defense, and I, I think it was Mary Kirby, because it, it, uh, it related specifically to a bug that had occurred in the, um, 
what was the DLC, Mark of the Assassin, where a, a character we really liked, who, which was uh, Serendipity, appeared, and there was a bug that did not, rec that, uh, I forget what it was. Anyway, the bug used a dialogue path that shouldn't have existed, but made it seem like, like everybody was reacting to something Serendipity had said, reacting to her being transgender, and going like, oh, that's awkward, or that, it was supposed to be that's awkward if you had slept with Serendipity <laughs> at, the, at the brothel. But it didn't, that, and, and, and we, we, we can't say, well, we intended for, for it to be taken this way. That, that's how it looked, and so the, it was perfectly valid for this person to come out and, and call us on it, and it was perfectly valid for them to add, well, you know, it would help if not all your transgender characters were uh, comedy, for comedy and prostitutes, and were like, you know what, you guys can stop rushing to our defense, that's absolutely legitimate. So that was the, where the origin of having May as a character came from, at least for me, in that, uh, I was like, well, okay, this is really outside of my comfort zone, but I think it's worth attempting. So when I, when I started with the, the comic, I was talking to the artist and uh, um, uh, who, the, the other writer who, I can't remember his name now, wow. Uh, anyway, Alex Freed, yes. Um, and talking about, okay, what would be a good way to do this? So what I didn't want to do was have a transgender character whose only point was to be transgender. I didn't want her to come into the scene and, and in, her, in her first couple of lines say, oh, by the way, I'm transgender. Not that that would be the worst thing in the world, but I, I thought, I, I wanna, wanna see if I can sort of get something across a little bit differently. So we talked about having her appear in the second comic, uh, second series, and for it not even to come up. And when we, when we got to the third series, like, okay, this is where it's gonna come up. And the question was how to, to do that. And I had a few ideas, and, but I, I wasn't sure if that was, because of my worry about the, having the, the, the shirtlessness. Because I, 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 I wanted a way to, to talk about it and it have it be obvious, but uh, with it being art, um, if, you're, if you're going for physical form, you're always gonna have the possibility that the reader may interpret that, that difference being due to art style. So I wanted to be very obvious but I was worried that it might come across as uh, there for titillation purposes. So, I mean, uh, the, the one thing I, I did, and I, and I hope it was the right thing, uh, I passed off the, the script to Maddie Bryce, who is one of the other bosses of honor here, and I said, Maddie, could you, could you please take a look at this and tell me that if, the, if this is a bad thing to do. I think uh, of her feedback, uh, I think she said, I think it would have been nice if we'd had more opportunity for uh, May to react uh, at the sort of the, the, the intimacy, like the, the, it really is a kind of a, uh, a violation in a way of a, tr a transgender person being exposed in that way that we never got the opportunity to explore that. But overall she was like, uh, there's a couple of changes she asked for and we, ta we talked with uh, Chad Harden, the artist, and we wanted to make sure that when it was presented it wasn't in a titillating fashion, it was just done matter of fact. And the writer could go, oh, the, sorry, the reader could go, oh, okay. I, I see who May is, and it just is acknowledged, and Varric accepts her, and we move on, and what's more important is the part she plays in the story. And I, I get that, uh, I know that there's, there's been uh, uh, some readers who said, well, that, that wasn't the greatest way to present the character, and I, I totally accept that. I, 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 I like to think that I, I did my due diligence, and I, I've read some of that feedback, and, and we'll uh, move forward and take it into account. I think there are other ways to present a transgender character as well, for sure. Uh, I think we are probably almost done, yes? But the, the awesome Maleficent in the back. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. I'll just project. Um, and as a transgender person myself, um, I did want to comment actually kind of build on a lot of the points I wanted to say. But um, it does, it did frustrate me when Queen of the Dragon Age appears. Like, I fully support the guys, love the guys. But Thank you. Serendipity was with one of the characters, yes. Yeah.
Yeah, no, it is perfectly valid. Uh, all I will say uh, on that front is that the writing team has talked about it. May is not, so like I put forward May in the comic and I'm like, that's the only transgender character I wanna have. Isn't that enough for you guys? Just accept it. No, no, we would like to have other transgender characters as well. And they, like you say, there, there are other, there's more than just transgender as well. And, and I mean, whether we will ever do it, I don't know. It really, like I said earlier, it takes one person who says, I personally as a writer would like to explore that. And it, we may very well get there, but uh, 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 the writing team has talked about it, and we would like to explore that in different ways. And, and uh, when you see Inquisition, I think that will be self-evident. Self Yeah, I mean, uh, there is a T in LGBT as well, so it's, it's part of it. Uh, one, one more question uh, I think we have time for. Um, sure. <laughs> I get it. Uh, uh, talking about having, uh, you know, like the world sort of recognize it a little bit more. Uh, it, it's difficult just because it, that, that there's a certain level of depth in that, which requires the game to not be 90%, I'm going to kill you and stab you in the face, demon, to have, first have a conversation. Uh, so, yeah, I agree. That's something we, we could explore. Yeah, I know it takes up space. Yeah. It's not feasible at this point in the technology, but yeah. It does require a calculus. Somebody was asking, well, why do you have female desire demons? Why not have male or... I mean, my, the original thing I wanted was androgynous female uh, desire demons, so more like... Uh, everybody reads Sandman, like desire? That's, that was my original thinking for that. But they put female, they're like, well, why don't you have male as well? It's like, well, it's not so much as us just flipping a switch. We do have to do a whole new model, and that's, that's really the limitation we have in terms of how well we can physically present it. And I'm getting the, the, the cutting motion. Uh, thank you very much.